Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Malcolm Woodhams, Chairman of the Association of Guernsey Charities. And on behalf of the Association's Council, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Association's 35th Annual General Meeting. We took the decision that we needed to execute our requirement to hold an annual meeting for members. However, obviously given the current restrictions to gatherings and in the interests of safety and well-being of our members, we're utilising this live stream method that has been tried and tested by many, not least, of course, the states of Guernsey for their COVID-19 briefings. For that, I thank Oliver Tracy for his expert help and guidance this evening. I also thank the Coteals for hosting us tonight. The agenda for tonight's meeting, together with the minutes from last year's AGM and the 2019 financial statements, have previously been circulated to members. The first item on the agenda is the adoption of the minutes from last year's AGM held on the 3rd of April 2019. While these have been well, whilst we've not been notified of any amendments or matters seeking clarification, therefore those will now be recorded as a full and accurate record. Item number two is the Chairman's report. May I start by thanking you for taking the time to join us for this, this meeting this evening. I realise that in choosing the Facebook platform to facilitate this meeting, some people who don't use Facebook may not be able to join us. However, I extend a special welcome to organisations that reside in the other islands of the Bailiwick who don't normally get the opportunity to join us due to the cost and impracticality of travelling to Guernsey purely to attend an AGC meeting. One of the disappointing aspects to our current situation is that we have had to considerably cut back and shorten our meeting this evening to the most essential items. We've also lost a key element of the Association of Guernsey Charities meetings whereby organisations can meet and network. They can raise matters of mutual concern and highlight topics of interest. It's certainly strange for me not to be able to look out into the room and see you and meet you. We obviously don't know what's in store for us through the remainder of this year in regards of the ability to meet together. So over the coming weeks, we're going to be reviewing our options and how we can best support you, local charities. When I mention we, that is the Association's Council, which currently comprises eight people plus myself as chairman. At this point, I'd like to thank my colleagues for all of their work on behalf of the Association and the charitable sector. At this year's AGM, we also thank and say goodbye to our Secretary, Jane LePedvin, who's returned to the UK, and Sector Representative Gordon Snell, who's resigned, but he has offered to con continue to help us in the future where needed. Thank you to Jane and Gordon both for your hard work and your support. I'm delighted to announce that Aaron Davies, who many of you all know from the Youth Commission, has agreed to be co-opted to the Council as a Sector Representative. In due course, we're going to be reorganising our sector representatives to ensure that we have the optimal coverage. As I assess the past year, it's not easy to know where to begin. It's almost been a year of two distinct halves. Following last year's AGM, I started a review of the Association of Guernsey Charities to consider such matters as what we deliver to the local sector and how we deliver it. How and where the sector could benefit from additional support? Was the needs of our community changing in what was required from the charitable sector? From this analysis, I produced the Association's first set of strategies and priorities, a document to crystallise our vision, mission and values. Furthermore, our Council agreed six broad aims and priorities to see us through the 15 months ahead. One of these priorities was to review the Association of Guernsey Charities branding. Working with Chris Griffiths and the team at Two Degrees North, we redefined the Association's visual image with a great new logo. We also added our new strapline, supporting the heart of our community. Our sincerest thanks go to everyone at Two Degrees North for working with us on this project and to the many people and charities who have since complimented us on our new brand. Of course, a logo doesn't make an organisation, however, it does tie together our values and convey our ethos. Last July saw another highly successful charities fate at Government House. Thankfully, 
the weather remained perfect and over 1,100 visitors enjoyed a mix of activities on offer from the 39 charities who attended. It was interesting to see from our post-event survey that most charities see the greatest value in raising their awareness, followed by raising funds and then attracting volunteers. The 26 organisations that responded raised a total of more than £6,100. Sadly, with the current situation, we have recently had to take the decision to cancel the event planned for this year, but our intention is to return next year. Last September was our hugely popular charity forum, The Power of Our Voluntary Sector. This joint venture between the Association of Guernsey Charities and the Lloyds Bank Foundation for the Channel Islands brought two guest speakers from the UK. Alex Van Vleit from the Lloyds Bank Foundation spoke about the value for small, the in-depth research and analysis into the distinct, the distinct contribution, value and experiences of small and medium-sized charities in England and Wales, strictly relevant to the, to the bailiwick of Guernsey. We also welcomed Carl Wilding, who had only recently been appointed as CEO of the National Council for Voluntary Organisations. Carl has many years of experience of the UK's voluntary and charitable sector and his insightful and engaging presentation on time well spent focused on the value of volunteering, not only to the beneficiary, but also to the volunteer. If that was also part of a company's corporate social responsibility mission, tangible benefits also extend into the company. This formed the basis for additional research and analysis that the Association of Guernsey Charities began at the start of this year. In November last year, we held another of our popular charity forums, those events that are designed to provide updates and relevant help and guidance to local charities. At this stage, I should remind everyone that all of the work and events undertaken by the Association of Guernsey Charities is done so on a voluntary basis. All members of the AGC Council give their time because they all feel passionately about the charity sector and the benefits achieved. This first week of June is traditionally recognised and celebrated throughout the UK each year as Volunteers Week. As a member of the UK Volunteers Week steering group, I was closely involved with those discussions through the end of last year and the start of this in planning the event for 2020. As you know, the Association of Guernsey Charities has for many years coordinated the local publicity for Volunteers Week. And then the magnitude of the coronavirus pandemic quickly became apparent. In April, the decision was taken by consensus that any form of national celebration would not be appropriate. That said, there was an intuitive recognition that volunteers were already playing a very significant part within their communities throughout the country. By mid-March, it was clear that Guernsey was not going to escape the effects of this crisis. As a resolute and staunch believer in the power of the voluntary sector, I knew that local charities would not only be affected, but also in some cases may be best place to assist. The structure of the Association of Guernsey Charities meant that certain council members have direct responsibility for the various charity sectors. Through our consistent communication with charities, we gathered information on the status of local organisations. Monitoring charities that were suddenly being required to respond to an increased or different demand. I can honestly say that the past three months have been amongst the busiest I have ever experienced incredibly long days devoted to covering not only my day job but also the work with the association and engaging with the local voluntary and charitable sector. This monitoring will continue over the months ahead and we will do everything possible to ensure that local charities and community organisations do not suffer as a result of this crisis. Rather, we hope that the island's enthusiasm for our community will be stronger and the Guernsey Together mantra will grow. Once again, it is important that we all focus on the benefit to our society of a strong community, all working together, and we will be engaging with other people and local organisations over the weeks and months ahead in order that we can deliver this aim. 
Once again, I strongly urge any local charity that might require any additional help, advice or support, please reach out. We are here to help you. Yesterday saw the announcement that two more Bailiwick charities have been awarded a Queen's Award for Voluntary Service. Our sincere congratulations go to the Guernsey Voluntary Service and Guernsey Disability Swimming. This prestigious award is incredibly valuable to the charities as it conveys the highest standards of voluntary activity. A total of 28 local organisations have successfully received a QAVS since they were started in 2002 and I highly recommend charities consider the benefits that it will bring. More details are available on the internet, just search QAVS. The Association of Guernsey Charities continues to go from grow from strength to strength. We currently have around 320 active members and 28 organisations joined us in the past year. I'm delighted that as recognition of the importance of the local charitable sector continues to grow, so does the Association of Guernsey Charities and I'm proud to be your chairman of this organisation at such an important time. In recognition of the importance of the local charitable sector and the role that the Association of Guernsey Charities plays around the bailiwick, I'm delighted to announce this evening that His Excellency the Lieutenant Governor, Sir Ian Corder, and Guernsey's new bailiff, Richard McMahon, have kindly agreed to become joint patrons of the Association. Finally, to end, I assure you that the crucial part played in our islands by so many people who enthusiastically work in the charitable sector must not be underestimated. I sincerely hope that it will inspire everyone to do, want to do more to support the heart of our community. Thank you. We now move on to the next item on the agenda and that's the Vice Chairman, Peter Rose. Right, good evening. Um, this is one of the more bizarre things I've ever done in my life, but let's press on. I've only got a couple of things I just wanted to talk about. Uh, first one is giving, um, the AGC's online donations platform. Um, just for those of you that don't know how giving works, it's, um, it's a trust. Uh, it's officially known as the Guernsey Giving Trust, and it's controlled by a regulated trustee, Zedra, Zedra Trustees. Now, the reason for the formality around it is that if you if you collect money on behalf of somebody else and then pay it to them, uh, it's a regulated activity. It's broadly the same thing uh, as what a bank does. So we have to have some formality around it. Um, but the AGC manages the activities of giving on behalf of the trustee, uh, which means that uh, no one pays for, for running it, which is really, really good. Uh, and it's been very successful. It's raised over £300,000 uh, for you, the AGC members, since we launched it. Uh, and if any, anybody wants to see more about giving, um, it's because it's a charity, it's uh, an AGC member. It's got its own page on the AGC website. Uh, and you can see the accounts there. Um, the latest accounts, which we've uh, audited accounts, which we've posted are for December 2019. Uh, and those show that giving raised £71,000 or so during 2019. So uh, please do have a look. Uh, it's part of what the AGC does. Um, to find it, you go to the AGC website, uh, click on the Find Charity link um, and type in Giving in the, in the text box and that'll take you to the Giving page and all the data is there for you to see, including the uh, governing document, the, the Constitution. Now, um, 110 of our 320 or so uh, members are participants in Giving. Um, and during the lockdown, the level of donations has absolutely gone through the roof. Normally it runs at around about £6,000 a month, but we had £18,000 in March, £36,000 in April, and £22,000 in May. Uh, I can tell you it's been quite exciting doing the bookkeeping and the reconciliations, but don't worry about that. That's what we do for you. Uh, now, for those of you who don't yet participate, and there are over 200 who don't participate, we do insist on transparency. So if you want to participate, you must let us have your latest accounts and governing documents to post on your page of the AGC website. 
uh, and you also need to sign a declaration form um, agreeing to the principles of giving. One of the things um, that you have to agree to uh, is that occasionally, it's not very often, uh, occasionally we get money into giving's bank account for which there is no donation pledge uh, and there is no clue in the narrative about who it came from or where it's supposed to go. We do our best to track down the details, particularly uh, if it's larger amounts, we, we really pay attention to anything over £100. But below that figure, sometimes we cannot find it. Uh, and if, the, if, if there is money that we can't allocate, the agreement says it's used by the AGC for general charitable purpo purposes. And so far, we have used uh, £1,700 or so of these unidentified donations for the hashtag Stay Connected project, because we think that was a good project for the community. Uh, now, there are some of you um, who still don't, don't understand why giving is such a good deal for you compared to the other commercial platforms. We still find some of you are using these commercial platforms, just giving and so forth. So let me just explain um, briefly why giving is better. And it, and it focuses on charges. Giving only charges what the charges that itself is levied by the card processors. Now, PayPal is, uh, is one of the processors. They charge 1.4% plus 20p per transaction. Um, Barclay Card is the other one. It's slightly more complex because it depends on what sort of card you've used. But it also ends up at around about 1.4% plus 20p. If, on the other hand, your donors pay online with e-banking, those donations are free. Nothing is deducted from those. So, on average, uh, giving's charges deducted from uh, the donations amounts to about 0.75% of what the donor uh, wants to donate. Now, just bear that in mind, 0.75%. And there are no monthly fees. So let's just compare that with the other platforms. Just giving, which uh, some of you use, charges 1.9% plus 20p, plus £15 a month, plus another 1.25% if you want them to do your gift aid. That's compared to giving's 0.75%. Virgin Money Giving charges 4.5% plus £150 one-off setup fee. GoFundMe, another one that's used by some of you, charges 2.9% plus 25p. Now, these charges are just enormous compared to what giving charges. So if you are using any of these platforms, please, please direct your donors uh, to use giving, because you are simply throwing money away if you use other, those other platforms. Uh, right, I'm going to stop boring, boring you about giving now. And the other thing I'm just going to give you a quick update on uh, is what's happening with charity law, which is still going ahead, full steam, despite the health crisis. Um, I'll just briefly explain why it's needed, and I'm sorry for those of you who have heard it already, but I know some of you won't have done. At present, Guernsey has no charity law, just a requirement to register above certain thresholds. Now, that causes uh, problems for our reputation internationally. Uh, and in other countries, charities have unfortunately been at the centre of money laundering and terrorism financing. Obviously, that's not the case in Guernsey, but the time has now come for more formal law, particularly ahead of a very important evaluation of our effectiveness in the fight against money laundering and terrorism financing by the OECD, which is coming in the start of 2022. A clean report for the OECD is vital for the reputation of our finance industry so that we stay off damaging blacklists, which would be destructive for our economy. So that's why we're having it. What's coming? Well, if you recall, I told you last November that there will be two elements to the new law. There's going to be primary legislation, which basically just defines which bodies are considered to be charities and will therefore be subject to the law. And for the purposes of that, there will be a charitable purpose test. Now, I shared uh, with you the Jersey charitable purpose test last year, and I told ours is going to look pretty similar. Um, they're not going to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we're not expecting that primary legislation to be controversial and it shouldn't cause you too much difficulty, but you will all have to decide uh, which clause of the charitable purpose test best describes what you do. Don't worry about it. We've done it elsewhere. Uh, you won't have a problem, I don't think. 
Now, the primary legislation will go on to give power to the registry in consultation with um, policy and resources to set out the rules by which the charities will be governed. This is known as the secondary legislation. And this will be of far more relevance to you because it, um, you will all have to check that your governing documents uh, comply with that secondary legislation. Uh, again, I shared with you in November 2018 um, what's likely to be covered in those rules. Now, so far, I've seen nothing. Uh, but I am told that I will be able to see a draft of the primary legislation for comment by the end of June. Um, I don't yet know when I'll see a draft of the secondary legislation. It will be some months afterwards. And when we've seen a draft of that secondary legislation, we can start to think about how we can help you prepare for the new law. We've had some offer for help from some professionals, but until we have some certainty about what exactly is proposed, uh, we can't really do much more than give you very general guidance on what we think is coming. Um, uh, and there are some papers already on the AGC website, uh, which you probably ought to read or familiarise yourself with now. Um, they're on the AGC website, www.charity.org.gg. Uh, it's in the section that's entitled About the AGC. That's a menu bar at the top. And then there's um, a menu item on the side when you get there called Forum, November 2019. All the papers that you need to read are in there. So in summary, uh, new law is going ahead despite the health crisis. We do expect to see the draft law fairly soon. Uh, once we do, we'll tell you broadly what it says and whether we are comfortable with it. Uh, and then we'll look at it uh, and come back with you to you with some proposals on how we're going to help you comply. It will be coming later this year, so watch this space. You will all have to pay attention when it goes through. Um, and that's it from me. Shall we go on to the resolutions? Thank you, Peter. Yes, if you could do the, uh, start off with the first of the resolutions. Please. This is Malcolm's uh, chairing the meeting, but because the first resolution is about re-election of the chairman, I think I should probably, should probably do it. Um, and council recommends the re-election of, re of Malcolm to the position of chairman uh, for a further term of two years. If you, if you recall, Malcolm was originally elected for three years, but we had changed the um, constitution to enable a chairman to stand for five years uh, after Malcolm had been elected and we're simply proposing that he goes on to complete the final two years that he would have had if we'd have held the resolution after we changed the constitution, if you understand all that. Um, now, the way we're doing um, these resolutions is, obviously, we can't get people to um, put their hands up, which is what we normally do, uh, but we have invited members, uh, we, we've notified members of these resolutions in advance, and we have invited people to come back uh, with anybody who disagrees with any of these resolutions, because they're ordinary resolutions, not special resolutions. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that we have had no objections to Malcolm staying on for further two years. So um, I think Council uh, and we are, are, are now happy that uh, Malcolm is now re-elected for a further term of two years. Thank you very much, Malcolm. On to resolution number two. Peter, thank you very much for your report, and thank you, everyone. Uh, resolution number two, election of treasurer. The council recommends the election of Liam Ruddy to the vacant position of treasurer. Mr Ruddy has over 30 years' experience as a qualified chartered management accountant, which includes 25 years' experience in the capacity of finance director or chief financial officer. Mr Ruddy has also undertaken the role of the AGC Acting Treasurer since May 2019. Liam is proposed by myself and seconded by Peter Rose. Again, we haven't had any comments, so Liam, thank you very much. You are duly elected. Resolution number three, election of Secretary. The Council recommends the election of Mr Liam Ruddy to the vacant position of Secretary. Liam has served as company secretary for various companies for the, for the past 20 years and has eight years relevant experience as company secretary for the PLC in the City of London. Liam again is proposed by myself and seconded by Peter. We haven't had any opposition, so Liam again, you're duly elected to the role of secretary. Thank you. 
Resolution 4, election of new council member. The council recommends the election of Mr Aaron Davies to the vacant position of council member. Aaron has recently been co-opted to the council. He is a professionally qualified youth worker and community development officer. He has previously held roles as a youth worker working across a range of settings in his hometown of Wales and spent time as a development officer for a previous version of the National Youth Parliament for Wales. He moved to the Bailiwick in 2015 to take up the role of an area youth work manager with the Youth Commission, staying with the organisation to become their service lead for the community, voice and network services. Aaron is proposed by Karen Jagger and seconded by myself. Aaron, welcome to Council. And I hand over to Liam for the adoption of the 2019 annual accounts. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, I'll be brief uh, on this matter. Uh, the adoption of the 2019 annual accounts is usual business uh, at the AGM, but um, just some highlights uh, from uh, the, the accounts which were distributed to the members previously. Uh, the accounts have been prepared and reviewed by BDO, and our thanks go to them. Uh, in doing so, they haven't provided any qualifying remarks, or they haven't brought any matters uh, to the attention of the, AG, uh, the AGC Council, so really a clean bill of health, so to speak. Uh, some highlights from the numbers, basically uh, the total income um, in 2019 amounted uh, to £234,587 of which 218,118 was received from the 2018 lottery proceeds. Uh, the expenditure amounted to 223,878, and a net amount uh, of 206,819 was distributed to 39 charities. Uh, that was an average of 5,313 per grant award. The year uh, finished with cash in bank of £19,481 uh, and in finalising that is the, the, the total assets and the only assets held by the charity. Um, the current cash in hand as of today uh, in the controlled bank accounts is £11,877. So with that uh, Again, there being no objections received for the accounts, uh, I believe that uh, approves the adoption of the 2019 accounts. Liam, thank you for your help with that. Uh, resolution 6 is the election of auditors and the Council recommends the reappointment of BDO Limited as our auditors. There's no special resolutions for consideration at tonight's meetings, so we now move to item number five on the agenda of any other business. Have we had any other business notified to us? Yeah. Well, so we've not had any messages come in to us. I will just close the, the meeting here. I wanted to mention one final note. As many of you know, I work in the retail sector. Now, if I suggested that we were giving away something for free, I know that I'd have a queue right out the door, all appropriately physically distanced, of course. The reason that I mention that is as members of the Association of Guernsey Charities, you get access to two fantastic platforms completely free. I should say two additional platforms completely free. Volunteer.gg and giving.gg, as Peter talked about earlier. If your charity doesn't already participate, I strongly urge you to take a look and see if they would be useful to your organisation. Please also check that the information about your charity is relevant and up to date on the Association of Guernsey Charities website, www.charity.org.gg. Please add details about your news, events and volunteer requirements. These platforms are here to help you. As we close our meeting this evening, my thanks again to Oliver Tracy for organising tonight's live stream and guiding us through this.
And that's the close of tonight's formal meeting. Thank you. I now invite our guest speaker this evening, Sadie Sivita de Porca, Lead Officer for the so Social Investment Fund, to talk about the fund and also the COVID-19 Community Charity Appeal. Sadie. Thank you, Malcolm. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for staying online for this update. As you know, the Social Investment Fund, or SIF, has been a long time coming, but we're here now and already starting to help charities in the bailiwick. SIF started as an idea in 2017, put forward by the States of Guernsey, by the AGC, and supported by the Guernsey Community Foundation. Pol policy and resources thought it was a good idea, and the States agreed to establish it in 2018, but it has taken until the beginning of April this year to get the initial funding confirmed and get registered as an independent LPG. SIF's purpose is to, both, is to use both public and privately donated funds to invest in the third sector and improve joint working between government and the third sector. My role started in January and together with the board of Stephen Jones as chair, the Dean of Guernsey, the very Reverend Tim Barker, Susie Crowder, Beth Ann Haynes and Stephen Wakelin, we got to work on our strategy for the year, focusing on the development of grants programmes for the charitable sector, which I'll come back to later. Then, as you all know, the coronavirus pandemic hit and we realised that we had been set up, what we had been set up to do was not now the priority for charities, so quickly changed tack. We realised that charities in the Bailiwick, like charities everywhere, need exceptional funding because of the financial harm done to them in this crisis. This may be because they are doing something exceptional now that needs funds they don't have, or they have been able to do their, un their usual fundraising events or receive their normal income to pay for the vital work they usually do. We decided that SIF was best launched to launch an appeal to the public, now the COVID-19 Community Charity Appeal to raise funds to help those charities, and we have undertaken to put our own funds in to make sure charities are well supported. Some very generous people, businesses and charitable trusts, including the UK National Emergencies Trust, have sent funds to the appeal, and I'm delighted to say that we have now received over £340,000, an incredible amount. We are starting to award our first grants from the appeal, with grants so far totalling just over £80,000. Up until now, we have awarded grants to support loss of income to the following. Bright Beginnings, 8,624 towards salaries. Lee Hu Trust, 7,000 towards the warden's salary. Choices for 12,000, which also includes support for PPE costs. The Cheshire Home for 12,355, which again includes additional PPE costs. Sylvan's Football Club for 5,000. Health Connections for 5000 towards loss of income from the shop during lockdown and the Borg Hospice, 12500 also towards loss of income from the shop during lockdown. For new initiatives to support the community at this difficult time, we have awarded the Stay Connected project with 5000 towards tablets for older people or those with long-term health conditions to stay connected during lockdown or shielding or isolation. Lay Cotils, 5000 towards the Food for Families project, which has been supporting some of the families worst affected by the crisis with deliveries of home-cooked meals. And lastly, Autism Guernsey with 7,988 to provide IT resources to support people with autism in the community online and to replace IT equipment for staff. We realise that some charities will still not, know, still not know for some time what fundraising activities will have to be cancelled whilst life starts to get back to normal, and also how much income has been lost, and so we will be keeping back some funds to help those who may need to apply to us later in the year. Our friends in the Guernsey Community Foundation, the Lloyds Bank Foundation for the Channel Islands and other funders are also keen to help, so we feel positive about ensuring that charities remain viable. I now come back to SIF's business as usual grants, if we can call them that, that I mentioned earlier, for which we have now secured funding for this year. We are aiming to launch both a large grants and a small grants programme this around autumn time and will announce details publicly in due course. Although criteria are not yet defined due to the changing needs and priorities of both the sector, the states and the bailiwick as a whole in these extraordinary times, these grants will be to benefit the wide range of charities across the third sector and will look to provide vital support for the Bailiwick during its recovery from the effects of this pandemic and beyond. 
Finally, a reminder that we're still inviting charities to apply to us for appeal funding by contacting me for an application form. My contact details are within the newsletter the AGC sent out last weekend, and I'm sure Karen can provide them, or the AGC members. So I look forward to hearing from you soon if your organisation needs funding. We would like to thank the AGC for all their hard work to support and advise the char charitable sector during the crisis and to extend our special thanks to Malcolm for his support to SIF and the appeal, having done a lot of work to help us promote it, including giving.gg, and ensure donations came our way. Thank you for your time, and then next time SIF gives an update, I very much hope to be seeing you in person. And now back to Malcolm, who I think has some closing words for you. Thank you, Sadie. Uh, have we received any... Not comments? Really, well, just that Gateway has said if anyone needs a minibus, they want to leave home there, so if anyone would like a minibus for free. Thank you to everyone who's messaged us, by the way. I just had a look whilst uh, uh, Sadie was talking. Uh, we've had a lot of good messages coming in. Uh, Gateway have just mentioned that they're looking to rehome their minibus, so if anybody knows, then please contact us and we can put you in contact with them. As we've received no other messages, then I'm going to close the meeting. This was very much an experiment from our point of view to see if it worked. Now that we've seen that it does, we may be back later this year with another live stream if we're still unable to have a conventional meeting and meet you all again. Until then, please take safe, keep up the good work, and we'll speak soon. Good night. <laughs>